Namaste. We have reached verse 29. One practice of yoga offers the incoming breath or prana into the outgoing breath, apana, and the apana into the prana, thereby through pranayama, or control of the energy, rendering breathing unnecessary. Now this is actually, he has come out and spoken of Kriya Yoga here. Kriya Yoga is not a technique that we're allowed to teach in a, a public way. And some people say, well, I, I know that story of uh, Ramanuja when he was given the mantra Om Namo Narayan and his guru don't, told him don't do it because it's, uh, it's not uh, something to be told publicly, but um, for your uh, own sake, don't tell people. And uh, Ramanuja said, but is it, is it uh, something that will save everybody? He said, yes, it will, but they, you have to keep it for yourself. So Ramanuja went to a temple roof and shouted, everybody, come here, come here. And there were thousands of people there. And he taught them this mantra, and they were all dancing in the streets. Well, that's a sweet story from history. But with Kriya Yoga, it is true that you can't, it's not, uh, it's not a good thing to give sacred things to. As Jesus said, don't throw your pearls before swine. Don't give holy things to people who are not ready for them. And you have to be sure that they're ready. So with Kriya Yoga, it would not be right to teach it until people want it, first of all, ask for it, and are ready for it. And that takes a certain amount of preparation. So I cannot teach the technique itself, but I can give you the basic theory of it, and this is important to understand too. And that is that the pran, pran is not just the, the breath, the pran and upon, most people think inhaling and exhaling. Actually, the real breathing is in the astral spine the ida and the pingala. And in the astral spine, you breathe this way, but in uh, um, physical breathing, you breathe in because of the upward movement. It causes, that upward movement in pingala, in ida, causes you to inhale physically. And the downward movement causes you to exhale physically. Now, um, this inner movement of energy, I've talked about this before, and it's quite interesting because it all ties in with our reactive process. So that when the energy is coming up, we not only inhale, but we sort of react to the world more in a positive way. And how, when something exciting occurs, for example, and when we feel um, uh, discouraged or negative or whatever is the energy goes down and we sigh. So when people, you find people when they're very happy, they jump up and down. Why do they jump up and down? Because this inner, these spurts of energy in the spine lifting the body upward, causing you to jump. And when people are discouraged, they slump and they sit heavily and walk heavily. The downward current is stronger. And it's not a question of um, uh, it's not a, you have to understand it's a matter of which is stronger. Otherwise it would be uh, people jumping up and up and then they suddenly down. Uh, it would be absurd. That, it means rather that when the upward current is stronger, then you have this affirmation and uh, positive reaction. And when the uh, downward current is stronger, you have a negative reaction. So that negative people, even after they inhale, it's almost as though they inhaled only so, they could, so that they could exhale again. And with the positive people, it's as if they exhale only so they could inhale again. Anyway, these two things, this is the important thing to understand. As long as your energy is reacting to the world outside, you'll be caught in Maya. Your reaction to, well, uh, winning a lottery or something, it's outward. When something pleases you, or outwardly dancing, for example. Well, what you have to do is understand that the reason for that outward reaction is really your inward reaction of the mind, first of all, and the energy following that flow of the mind. And if you can learn to withdraw 
to your own spine, your reactive process to this world, then you can achieve that state that Krishna is talking about here in the fourth chapter of the Gita, and in fact, throughout the Gita, of being impartial, of not being attached to anything, being even-minded, and so on. We have to become centered here so that the world out there, and this is this whole passage he's talking about, drink, withdrawing the energy, offering it as an oblation, withdrawing the energy and offering it as a yajna into the infinite. So this is the supreme yajna, for which fire ceremonies are really only uh, a symbol. And if you take any ceremony with a, a deep concentration and reciting the proper mantras and so on, they will have some power. But that power will not be equal to um, your own inner effort to get rid of the ego and to offer everything mentally. I've seen people doing fire ceremonies here, and although I don't know the Hindi or didn't know it then or whatever, um, it's sort of, hey, Joe, bring me some more wood. Their minds are outward. There's all this, this uh, piling wood on and doing these oblations of ghee, etc. These are outward acts. The real oblation is when you're in yourself. The real fire ceremony is when you can raise your energy inwardly and offer it at the feet of Brahma. So you have to understand that the source, the, the way to find real success in spiritual seeking, the highest technique of all, is learning how to withdraw that energy into the spine so that you're not moving outward, you're withdrawing here inward. And what happens here is that when your energy, when your reactive nature, when your reactive process, your reactive process brings you into the spine, then what it does is circulate around the sushumna, the deep spine. And in, uh, in bringing the energy up and down gradually, the energy becomes so magnetized in the spine that then as it comes down, instead of coming up again, it goes into the sushumna. And then you stop breathing. The raising of kundalini in the sushumna is the essence of yoga. It sounds like a strange thing to people who haven't experienced it, but it is there, and it brings great joy also. So when you sit there, then try to feel that you're magnetizing your inner self, and the more you go into your inner self, the more this becomes your channel. This is where your reality is. You know the Shiva Lingam, um, I've wondered, people in the West have called it a phallic symbol, but it's Shiva. Why would Shiva be interested in that? No, it's not that. And nobody in India really thinks that way. It's Western uh, scholars who have imposed these thoughts on people. But I've experienced this and I know what it really means. In deep meditation, you begin to feel that you are a Shiva Lingam. Very interesting. You suddenly feel that your spine is just this rod and your energy is there, and all the energy is coming into this, and that energy moves upward. But the Shiva Lingam is actually a beautiful symbol. It's a, it's, sim, it's, symbol, it's a symbol of the spine, and of the energy coming up from that. And the Yoni is the symbol of the Kundalini, coming up from that to the infinite. So all true teachings in India take the mind inward. They're not bothered with the outward side. And scholars who teach, teach differently are simply ignorant. So as we do Kriya, gradually what we do, are doing is several things. We're magnetizing the spine, yes. But there's another aspect to it. Everything, every tendency that you've ever developed, every karma that you've ever performed, every action, these are um, samskars that settle in the spine. And they settle at different points in the spine. So that um, if they're very sensual, they'll be in the lower centers. If they're more about food, they'll be in the Manipur. If there are higher sp spiritual feelings, the samskars will settle higher. So what you have is like a river so clogged with uh, debris that it's very difficult for the water to flow. And what you have is a spine so completely clogged with... Uh, um, samskaras of many different types that uh, it's very difficult to raise your energy and to bring it up to the point between the eyebrows. Affirmation is good, 
breathing exercises are good, or all of these are good. But what Kriya Yoga does is getting into the spine, it helps to to loosen those samskaras in the spine and to direct that energy upward. So with Kriya Yoga, what you're really doing is burning up that karma inwardly. You can burn up that karma outwardly by uh, good actions and serviceful actions and giving self-giving actions. Anything that you do can be helpful spiritually. But this is very, this is the yoga that takes you right to the source of your own being. And the more you can work on the spine itself, the more you find that that, that as that energy is rising, you're clearing up those samskaras and the energy can come more and more clearly. As you open up each chakra, you find that because you've clarified it enough for the energy to flow inward instead of outward, this is the Kriya Yoga that finally helps you to attain that freedom. So Krishna is talking about a very deep and holy science when he says this. And this really is what he means when he says, Arjuna, be thou a yogi. Many people, however, think that it's only by technique that they will get there. I have to say that without devotion you will not get there. We don't think that, it's, that finding God is a mechanical thing. There has to be. This is why Krishna in the last chapter of the Gita, the 18th chapter, speaks with great fervor of the importance of devotion. Because you can leave everything if you have devotion and it's very deep, that will bring you up. So when you practice Kriya or do any breathing exercise, because there are other techniques to help you accomplish this, then put your heart into it. Feel that your energy is rising with all your feeling and devotion. And when you practice it, practice devotion, feel that you are doing this to find God, not, not just to uh, develop powers and so on. The more you can practice this, the more you will feel that energy starting to rise. You know, I told you this story before of that yogi, that yogi who had been practicing bhakti yoga for 20 years and he hadn't achieved that yet, that, that contact with God that he wanted. And my guru tried to talk him into taking initiation into Kriya. He saw he was ready for it. But the man felt that he was loyal to his own path and wouldn't do it. Well, my guru explained to him, it's not a question of path, this is a universal truth. You can follow any path you like, but this will take you to the, to the center. He said, you've been in a room for 20 years trying to get out through the wall, through the ceiling, through the floor. He said, this will show you where the door is. The door is the spine. When you practice bhakti yoga, you must feel that you're offering your energy upward from the heart and through the spine to the point between the eyebrows. Practicing um, a mantra, you have to feel that the power of that mantra is taking your energy upward. It must be with devotion. If you were practicing jnana yoga, unless you love wisdom, you won't get there. If it's just an abstract exercise like playing chess, it won't take you there. There has to be this longing. And in karma yoga also, you must, you must serve God with love. This is why I said recently that when you do act for God, feel that you are doing it, doing it as well as you possibly can. Your action, you should feel God acting through you, but you must feel that you are giving that action to him. And in giving it to him, do you want to give him an imperfect sacrifice? No. There's a story of a man, a king, who was uh, out hunting one time, and uh, his, his, his minister, his chief minister, couldn't come with him that day. Well, some dacoits took this king, and they were all ready to sacrifice him and kill him when they saw that he was missing a finger. The king had cut his finger in a, um, an accident. And uh, so when he saw his, they, they couldn't sacrifice him because he was an imperfect offering. So they sent him back. And when he saw the minister, he, he said that, uh, well, first of all, when he had cut his finger, he thought, what a misfortune. The minister said, it will be a great blessing. And everything is for the best. So when he came home, he said, all right, you were right. 
I did lose my finger. It was for the best. It saved my life. But he said, uh, what did it do to you? I was so angry with you, I had to throw you in prison. And you see, I'm sort of remembering the story as I go along. The minister couldn't be with him because the king was so angry with him for saying that uh, um, this is all for the best, that he put him in prison. So when he came back, he asked this man, he took this man out of prison. And then he said, all right, you were right. Losing my finger did save my life. But what about you? You went to prison. And the minister replied, no, sir. If I had not been in prison, I would have been with you, and they would have taken me, and I have not lost a finger. So it's a cute story, but the truth behind it is that everything always does work out for the best if we give it to God. So try to give a perfect offering of your own self. Therefore, whatever you do as karma yoga, do it to the very best of your ability. Don't think it's all maya, so it doesn't matter. Of course it doesn't matter in the abstract, but in the concrete, it does matter. You're giving the best offering that you can to God. And that is the offering you want him to accept. So in Kriya Yoga, offer your heart, offer your whole being. Every time you bring this energy out, feel that you're offering it to him. You will find in time that that energy, just like a river, will, when it's strong, that flow of energy takes all the little whirlpools along the edge of the river and takes them all in that great current going down to the sea. So in the practice of yoga, have devotion to, have longing for God. Don't do it automatically. People who practice yoga without devotion, dry as dust, they'll never get there. First of all, in all you do, the most important quality is devotion. Joy to you.